eye surgery. I didn't think it would ever happen, but I did find something. And so I have no financial interest. Um, the history of uh, iris repair and, and corneal suturing uh, began with Malcolm McCannell in 1976. Dr. Seepser modified that in 2005. And then uh, myself and Dr. Nicholson in 2012 came up with a fisherman's knot aboard the US hospital ship Mercy. <coughs> There's a low cost simulator that Dr. Devi Mandaji in Monado, Indonesia developed using a plastic one liter bottle, used blue jeans for the iris and uh, super glue using a crochet hook and needle and yard and heavy thread. The technique involves using a tenoproline CF needle or teno Gore-Tex. Some use a ninoproline. Uh, Boris Maliugin prefers that. And uh, you enter the eye two clock hours from your intended closure. Use of an iris hook or tying forceps to twist the knot. And it's an easy knot to remember, which I'll show you in a moment. And it doesn't slip like the uh, seeps or not. So here's a uh, So this is showing the seeps or not. <coughs> okay, so this is showing the seeps or not, how uh, when they do this knot, they pull the loop through, and then he twists the suture around back and forth around the loop. And uh, the only problem with that is sometimes you can untie the knot right after you've tied it. And it doesn't always hold, as you'll see here. So when he pulls this tight, it loosens up again. See that? So it doesn't always work. Um, iris repairing suture, we put it through the, the iris and um, tie it, and this is an example of a coloboma that we repaired. And you can do a pupillary cyclage by uh, going through several bites. And then the next step is to pull the loop through uh, and pull it out of the eye, and then twist the loop five times. And what that does is it does the same thing as the seeps are weaving it back and forth. So this is, the, this is the typical fisherman's knot when you're tying a hook on. You put it through the, the uh, loop in the hook, you twist it five times, and then you bring the, the fishing line back through that loop. Right through here. And then pulling it tight, and this will hold a very heavy fish, so it works really well. This is my simulation of the fisherman's knot using a pair of blue jeans and a uh, single O suture. So you pull the, the uh, suture through, reach in with a hook, pull it out of the eye, twist it five times.
and then pass the needle through the loop. And that way you can never uh, forget how to do it in the middle of a, a battle in the OR. It holds really well. And then I always put a, a second loop, a locking throw in. So grab, the, grab a loop again and twist it twice the opposite way and then just pass the needle through that loop again. And then that uh, locks the suture really well. So. Um, I think for the sake of time, this is a 85 year old woman who uh, had cataract surgery uh, 20 years before and had some trauma 15 years ago seen at the residence clinic for the traumatic iridodialysis and traumatic IOL dislocation. Um, the IOL actually was extruded out of the eye and she was aphakic and we decided to put in a secondary lens 12 years ago. And then um, <coughs> not too long after that she was hit by a car backing up as a pedestrian and it dislocated her lens with an iridodialysis. And to complicate matters, she was taking warfarin and aspirin at the time. And so this is, uh, this is her, her video. Let's see if I can get that to play. There we go. So here we're twisting the loop five times and we're going to pass the needle through the loop as you see here and then pull the opposite ends and that helps to close up the, the defect. All right. So some of the pearls for iris suture repair, sometimes perfect can be the enemy of very good. Uh, you should have everything prepared and ready to start with your tenoproline on the table. Uh, you definitely need to do a retrovulvar block or general anesthesia on these cases because otherwise the patient's going to feel the iris and they, they'll move. And any sudden patient movement can be a disaster. Uh, you can actually pull the entire iris out of the eye. Uh, be prepared, so be quick. Get in and get out. And then um, stop the anticoagulants for a week. And one thing I tell my residents, sometimes what they have is better than what they could end up with. And um, this is, uh, let's see. This, no, no, this is not working. So this is the fisherman's knot for iris repair. Um, so here we take two bites of the iris and we dock the needle with a 25 gauge needle as we saw earlier from another presenter. Um, we pull that out of the eye and then we reach in and grab a loop of the suture and then we twist it five times with tying forceps and then we pass the needle through that loop. Sometimes you have to pass it backwards. And then just gently pull it together to tie it off. And that works really well. And then we put in that locking throw afterwards. Um, that's really all I have. Thanks very much. I request my co-instructors, Dr. Meenu, uh, Dr. Arup Chakraborty, Dr. Arup Bhomik, Dr. Kumar, and Dr. Deepak Magur to come on stage. And Dr. Meenu will take charge of uh, the session for the time being. I'll be uh, running to another hall and I'll be back soon. Thank you, Meenu, for taking care of this.
Okay, good morning, everyone. The first speaker is Dr. Arup Chakravarti. Can, can you put the presentation on the screen? Yeah, thank you. So good morning, friends. It is nice to be here in uh, Suvin's course. I'll be talking about small people, a different approach. We all know that small pupils can be pretty challenging. And uh, there are a lot of devices out there in the market. With our own Suvin coming up with his own BH design, uh, which is ex 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 extremely good device. But uh, from time to time, we do end up working in small people situations without using any device. Uh, these devices may be expensive. Of course, ex expense is a relative term. And uh, there may be uh, complications associated with handling of these devices. So in certain select cases, I think it may make good sense to use an approach, a small people approach, without using any device. So I have nothing financial here. Uh, knowing the etiology of the small people is important. If I know it is an eye face candidate, pupil is more less than three or four millimeters in size, I would not uh, dare to use any technique that doesn't depend upon a device. It is a device right from the word go. On the other hand, if I have uh, situations, uh, small pupil situations because of uh, traditional etiology, and if the pupil is, let's say, more than four millimeters in size, I would use a non-device technique provided there are no comorbidities, significant comorbidities like you know, a shallow anterior chamber, a, uh, uh, unhealthy corneal endothelium, very hard cataract, very soft cataract, or a subluxated cataract. So uh, a patient who has been on pilocarpine, a glaucoma patient who has been on pilocarpine eye drops, the medications have to be stopped one week before the surgery. I routinely use a combination of tropicamide with phenylephrine uh, eye drop, with phenylephrine, uh, applied three or four times, uh, one hour before the surgery. I also start the patient on NSAID agents uh, one or two days prior to surgery. Uh, intraoperate, uh, the intracameral adrenaline is not used in most of the cases, but we, in certain cases, we do add uh, some amount of adrenaline, half an ampoule of one in 1,000 preservative-free adrenaline in the irrigation uh, fluid. Omidria is another similar uh, uh, pharmacological agent that has been FDA approved as well as CE approved. And uh, that is not, but uh, but you know, variations of that are available in the Indian market. Another important concept is avoid pupillary fatigue. So if you have to dilate the pupil preoperatively to see the fundus or for whatever reason, you can use tropicamide plus, tropicamide one person. Don't use the cyclopentolate eye drops. Now this is about omidria. It is basically uh, a, uh, com a, 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 a pre drug, so it has to be reconstituted and added to the infusion fluid, and uh, it maintains the pupillary midrasis for quite some time, which is enough for the surgery, and postoperatively it reduces pain. Now, if in, in spite of all these things, if I don't get uh, the pupil to dilate to a significant size, comfortable size, I would be resorting to a sphincter sparing method for enlarging the pupil with cosmesis in mind, and if that doesn't work, then I would, uh, would not have any other option other than tampering with the sphincter to enlarge the pupillary size. So this is, I think, a uh, technique of posterior synecolysis, which is very important in many situations. In small pupils, when you release the, the focal synechia, the pupil really dilates. So you can release the synechia in various ways. This is, of course, not a small pupil, but you can use a cyclodialysis spatula where the AC has been formed with a viscoelastic agent. And in certain situations like this, where you require to stain the anterior capsule with ripen blue dye, uh, I would form the anterior chamber with an irrigation cannula, and then perform a posterior synecolysis. Because if we use HPMC uh, to you know, perform the intraocular manipulations, and then try to stain the anterior chamber, anterior capsule with ripen blue dye, at times it may be a little difficult for us to achieve it. Yeah. 
in uh, certain situations uh, of uh, s small, on small, small people situations uh, where you have to use a tripan blue dye staining. Now, if you use a conventional technique to stain the anterior capsule, you'll end up with something like this. You know, only the central part is stained. It is not a very homogeneous staining. Peripheral area is not stained. And sometimes in white cataracts, when the rex is made run to the periphery, and you, you still have an option to, opportunity to, to salvage the rex is, uh, it, this kind of staining definitely doesn't help you. So I use a particular technique which I'm just going to demonstrate. So here, so this is actually a post-angle uh, closure glaucoma trabeculectomy eye. So I have uh, injected Helon 5, you could also do Helon GV, you know, on the section, on the, wherever the incisions are made, and uh, just to plug the incision, and then go in into the anterior chamber, inject ripened blue dye, little under the iris so that the, there is an opportunity for the dye to spread all around, and it gives rise to a very homogeneous staining. As you will see in this particular case, one, pu one of the pupil is dilated here. I think I had to use a device for this particular case. The dilatation was sufficient for, uh, the pupil staining was sufficient for that particular case. Uh, viscometriasis is one strategy that really works out <coughs> extremely well, particularly uh, in high myopia situations or patients who have undergone a posterior segment surgery with silicon oil fill. Uh, it is not that, you know, it gives you a very good dilatation, but, you know, one or two millimeter additional dilatation that you get by you injecting Helon 5 at the pupillary margin at times may be sufficient for you to get a good uh, pupil to perform a safe rexis. And once the rexis is done, even if the pupil comes down, it may not be very difficult for us to tackle the nucleus. So this <coughs> is viscomidriasis. So now, uh, <coughs> this, is, this is another uh, technique that uh, pupillary membrane dissection, if you find pupillary membrane occluding uh, the pupillary area, so the, 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 the midriatic agents won't really definitely work. None of the techniques are going to give you a large pupil size. So you have to dissect the pupillary membrane from the pupillary margin. And once that is done, in ma many of these cases, you may have a four or five millimeter pu pupil size. And that should be enough for you to perform a, f a capsular axis and a good uh, phaco calcification. But sometimes, you know, that may not be enough, so you may have to perform some other maneuvers. So this, this was one such case where I was not uh, sure about the presence of pupillary membrane preoperatively. And during surgery, I found that I was not able to remove the pupillary membrane. So I made a small hole uh, around the pupillary margin, uh, including a little bit of, a uh, little small thin ring of healthy iris tissue cut it around and, and uh, you know, you use, uh, you so finally got a pupil which is about uh, four, five millimeters in size, which is sufficient for us to perform a safe phaco calcification. Uh, intraoperatively, the pupil comes down and you're close, cl uh, almost closing the surgery. It's not a very difficult case. In that case, you can definitely use a second instrument to retract the pupillary margin to give you a better view if you have to do sculpting or even if you have to do chopping, as you'll see in this particular case. Here the pupil comes down, and then because I'm using a chopping technique, uh, for vertical chopping, you don't have to work from the periphery. You work from in the visible area. So definitely the nucleus cracks and uh, it goes on very extremely well. But however, if, I'm if this particular case had a very hard cataract or a very soft cataract, I'd be using a pupillary device to get uh, the pupil to dilate to a larger size and perform a safe phaco calcification. In IFIS, uh, another thing that I wanted to tell you, the intraoperative iris prolapse. IFIS, this was an IFIS candidate. Pu I pupil uh, becomes small and the iris starts prolapsing out. So please do not try to deposit the eye prolapsed iris from the main incision. You have to take a approach from the side port. However, however much you try from the main incision, it doesn't go in. So it has to be from the side port. And subsequently make sure that you maintain the anterior chamber depth well. Uh, do not allow the anterior chamber to shallow and the iris to prolapse out. I, this is another IFS candidate, and you must remember that the irrigation th in this candidate should not go at the level of the pupillary plane or in the posterior chamber. Because the turbulence that happens, you know, that releases prostaglandins and the intra intra intraoperative meiosis occurs. So rexis is slightly smallish in these kind of situations, and your irrigation and all the, f all the phaco manipulations happen within the capsular bag. So that is very important. So for IFIS uh, candidates where the pupil, I start off with, let's say, six or seven millimeters, I'd not be using a device. I'd be using a pharmacological strategy. Make sure that the incision is properly constructed. Hydrodissection, hydromaneuvers has to be very slow and gentle. 
use lower irrigation aspiration parameters. On the other hand, if I start off with a pupil which is three or four millimeters in size, I'll start off straight away with a device. So, so friends, in uh, uh, conclusion, uh, non-device uh, approach towards small pupil definitely gives good results if you have properly selected your patient. If your patient doesn't have any history of lower urinary symptoms, it's not an IPS candidate. Proper pharmacological modulation definitely allows you to avoid uh, devices in many of your surgical patients. Appropriate technique, uh, sphincter tearing, uh, sparing technique, I think is my go-to technique if the pupil doesn't dilate further. And uh, I would be using a device if there are significant comorbidities and uh, if the pupil becomes so small that intraoperative manipulations become hazardous for the patient. And of course, it goes without saying the surgery has to be performed in a very careful manner. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll be going to another hall right now, so if there's any questions or if anybody wants to add something, uh, I'd be very happy to take it. So if there are no questions, thank you, Dr. Arup, for uh, describing in detail regarding viscometriasis. We'll now move on to Dr. Arup Bhomik from Dishai Hospital, and uh, he will talk to us on iris hooks. Good morning. Uh, my topic is iris hook, pearls, and pitfalls. Uh, I have no financial interest. And that's the problem is, what is the exact size of small pupil? How we define the small pupil? How much, whether it is a four millimeter or this is a five millimeter? Or, so it is, a, there is a lot of controversy or regarding the early of uh, around 2000, uh, 2000, 2001 and 2002. There is a lot of papers how to do a fecomulsification in small pupil. But in end of 2005, when the concept of IPS came, the, this changed the whole scenario and understanding of small pupil. So just watch the two uh, uh, schematic diagram as carefully. In small pupil, if your iris uh, rexis is larger than that is a previously as advised regarding how to do a phacoemulsification in case of small pupil, you just go beyond your pupil margin how to do a larger rexis larger than your pupillary size. So if you make a larger rexis than your pupil size, that just think of the fluidics of the eye, the, the fragments can hit the iris uh, pupillary margin and the fluids can hit the undersurface of the iris and it is slowly come down. And this is a second scenario where your rexis margin is smaller than the pupillary size. Then the fluidics will be within the chamber and in the anterior chamber. This is the main understanding regarding the IFIS because if in ICs there is any heat of nuclear fragments or fluid in the uh, in the undersurface or pupillary margin, pupil will come down. So that is a whole. Ch it's a game changer, how to understand uh, this understanding of IFIS. The hook, what is the hook? Basically, it's a, there is a lot of uh, debate which is better, hook versus ring. In my opinion, both has its own merits. Hook, it basically fix the pupil with the limbal ring and it's more effective. And the far as the ring, it's basically support the pupillary margin. And this is uh, iris hook as described, first described by McCool in 1991. He made a titanium hook for the surgery. I'm not going into the detail of the history. The how technique of the iris hook, now it's a self selling stem incision in the limbus. It should be as, as scleral as possible. Incision should be made as posterior as possible. Uh, you can use four, uh, you can use five flexible, or you can use a one sub incisional, you can use a one incisional. So AC should be filled with the viscoelastic before uh, putting the hook. It is better to put a some amount of viscoelastic is, uh, elastic under surface of the iris to lift the iris above the capsule. And uh, this, uh, uh, and in all cases, if your pupil is very small, to prevent the pupillary sphincter tear, it is better to stretch the pupil. If your pupil is two millimeter, it is better to stretch the pupil a little bit to avoid 
the pupil is sphincter tear postoperatively. Just this scenario, if, you, if your incision is corneal, it is tend to hook. Basically, it is a lift the iris. Or if your, if your uh, stab incision or uh, uh, iris hook is the plane of the iris, it will basically retract the iris nicely. That's the, the, it, it's basically very simple to Uh, simple to, uh, you can mark your position, the, those who are starting uh, now, is you can mark with the pen your four position and just putting the hook, this is a Gishevar hook and it's a very nice hook because uh, uh, you can use with autoclave and you can, I use this uh, almost more than, with autoclave more than 30 times and par uh, for the parkes you is reduce the cost. And just just fit it with the uh, with the pupillary margin. Don't tighten now. After the uh, engaging the whole hook, and now you can tighten the tighten and the see the pupillary margin. And the removal also very 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 easy. Just just turn the hook towards the cornea, flange of the hook towards the cornea. It will come out very easily. The advantage is com compared to other device, it is very low cost, better ability, you can reuse it and dealing with pupillary mydriasis even after rexis. Because sometimes it's very difficult uh, like malugin ring, if you do a rexis and then putting a uh, malugin ring, it can catch the rexis margin and it can tear the rexis margin. You have to be very careful to implant a malugin ring after doing rexis, but in uh, iris hook, it is very easy. Disadvantage is time consuming compared to any pupillary device. Paracentesis, you, make, uh, you have to make four, uh, four or five uh, paracentesis. But main disadvantage in my uh, dislodgement hook during FACO because it's a long flange can hit the adenaxa and it can dislodge during your FACO, during movement, uh, your FACO probe. And this is the case I started. This is a, uh, I started the pupil uh, was almost 5.25 millimeter, but I started the rexis was absolutely the uh, pupillary size and as fluidics uh, of the FACO started, it hits the under surface and it's come down. And I'm planning to uh, put whether this is ideal, uh, uh, this is a very important, if you put uh, malugin ring or uh, any other pupillary device, it can catch the rexis margin. And uh, better in this situation, it is better to use iris hook. Just put uh, some amount of viscoelastic under surface of the uh, iris, lift the iris, and catch the pupillary margin. Just fast forwarding this case. My time is over. And Just implanting before implanting I will just release a, uh, um, uh, the hook a little bit so that it cannot uh, the uh, optic should not hit the iris and after implanting just the removal of the hook is very easy just turn around towards the center of the pupil and it will come out very nicely I just showing one situation where always uh, uh, the Iris hook is score over the over uh, uh, pupillary devices. See, I am implanting multipiece, surgeon in implanting multipiece, and with the haptic, leading haptic, there is a PC range, and the pupil is small. In this particular case, this type of case, you never, you never, uh, never to use other device. You have to use the iris hook, and you can see this for better vi visualization dilate the pupil, lens was put into the sulcus and optic capture was done and removal of the hook was done. So in my paper ends, uh, today I am using a uh, pupillary device but uh, to pupillary device, but 
two cases I always uh, use ID SUC in complete, uh, uh, incomplete pupil like coloboma and planning to implant uh, IOL in the sulcus in case of PXA. It's a, now it's a standard teaching in case of PSA, we should put uh, multi-piece IOL into the sulcus. And power operative biases, I always prefer to uh, uh, put hook and where I expected small pupil and I expecting some kind of ju uh, genular laxity. If I, uh, first I catch the pupil in margin, the hook, if there is a, some amount of genular laxity, I can use that hook to catch the rexis margin. In conclusion, iris hook is less costly, reusable, and very user friendly, but in case of uh, rings, all our rings, is, uh, it creates definitely less pupillary stress compared to iris hook, and it don't need any extra wound. But yes, but it's the uh, iris hook always score over the uh, any kind of pupillary device because it is reusable and the cost of iris hooks is very less. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Arup. Um, actually, uh, regarding virus hooks, this was a very, very comprehensive and uh, very clear explanation of how to use um, virus hooks. Yes, please. I have one question, sir. Mm. For per-operative meiosis, you have started the case on topical anesthesia. So now you want to apply hook. Will you give uh, peribulbar block? No, no. You just can, uh, uh, most of the cases, even in a small pupil, we are using ring, any kind of ring to support the pupil in margin, never use uh, uh, perivalva for, for that. But in case patient is uncooperative, then you can uh, put a little bit of intercamellar gyloquine, uh, and you can put hook. But uh, even in topical, we use uh, iris hook, uh, there is a patient didn't feel any problem. But you don't stretch too much, just, uh, to improve your visibility to the capsular axis margin. And as iris hook always fix the iris with the limbus, limbal ring, it is always very safe, very stable during the, uh, during the surgery in cases of IFIS. Never jump. So Thank don't basically be scared to touch the iris yeah. on topical. It doesn't pain. So please put hooks on topical, no issue. So we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Kumar, doctor. Uh, he'll talk to us on uh, malignant ring pearls and pitfalls. Good morning and thank you. I'm going to talk about the malignant ring and uh, show you a few videos. So this is just retracting the plunger and the whole ring comes inside your injector. It's very easy. But now what I'm trying to show you here is just notice one thing, is that the anterior chamber is very, very shallow. So even if the AC is shallow, don't be scared of using the ring. It's really not uh, an issue. Uh, you can see a iridectomy here actually because the AC was very shallow. And this is maximum that the pupil dilates. So now I'm showing a technique where we take three scrolls onto the iris in one shot. So this is the distant scroll which we are engaging the iris and then comes the nasal and the temporal. You just have to tilt your hand a little to the nasal side and a little to the temporal side, and you'll see that I'm engaging the iris. So in one shot, I'm getting three scrolls onto the iris itself. You can want to do, you can even go ahead and take a Krugner's hook and take the fourth scroll into the position. But here I'm releasing the fourth scroll, which is a sub-incisional scroll, and then come out, and then you can take, always go through the side pot. That's another trick. As far as putting the fourth scroll or the sub-incisional scroll is concerned, always go through the side port and then we go ahead and place it. There are many ways of doing that. So you know that right now you can see that three scrolls are in position. Now this is through the main incision. Don't use this instrument, don't use a Sinsky hook and don't use the Bessets Y. The best thing to use is a Krugner's hook. But I'm trying to show you mistakes that I make so that you'll know what not to do next time. So here I'm going through the main incision, holding on to the scroll and engaging the iris and then getting it into position and this gives you a good enough size for safe echoemulsification. As far as removal is concerned, again, it's very, very easy. Previously, used to, I used to disengage two scrolls, but now you really don't need to do that. Here, as you notice, I've disengaged only the sub-incisional scroll, that is this one, and the rest one I have not done at all. So this and the inferior and the temporal, I have not at all uh, disengaged. So I just release that, go in with the injector, remove the plunger, 
make sure that the stainless steel plate the stainless steel plate is just below the scroll so that's one care that you have to take at at the time of removal and then again as you can notice both the scrolls come in just withdraw the plunger and the third scroll and the fourth scroll all come in together at this stage you can make a mistake so go through the side port use any sinski hook or a iris repositor whatever you like just depress it a bit because sometimes these scrolls tend to get engaged into the injector at this level so sometimes just depress it a bit there and it will make sure that it just comes out very smoothly so see that sometimes you get some resistance just press it a little bit and keep withdrawing and the so I just disengaged one scroll, which was a sub-incisional. The other three were not disengaged, and it comes out quite smoothly. But sometimes this can happen. So this is one care you have to take. This is the old Melugan ring. Now it, they have made a new one, which goes to two millimeters. This needed a larger incision, but you have to be careful of the desmens. Sometimes you can hit the desmens, and you can make a desmen strip at that level. Again, we are going to inject the Melugan ring, and I'm going to show you what happens if it slips out of your hand. So I got three scrolls in position. And now I'm using the Sinsky hook. Never do this. See what happens. Sometimes you may just release it and it goes behind the iris. So if that happens, don't worry. There is nothing really much to worry. Take the Bessette's Y, go from the side port, okay? And just go along the linear mar and then just go below and bring the scroll up. So it's very easy. Really nothing happens. And then go ahead and again place it onto the iris. So this is one more thing that may happen occasionally if you are using the Melugan ring, but you get a good enough dilatation once it's in position. So you have a nice round circular dilatation. And again, coming to the removal, make sure that the steel plate is below, and then just withdraw the plunger. And at this stage, if you need a second hand, you can go in with the side port. We're using a Sinsky hook or anything. Just depress the two scrolls, and the fourth scroll will just follow. So it's as easy as that. You can use any instrument at this level. Just press it a little bit and then withdraw. It's as simple as that. Now, what has happened is midway, I needed to put the ring. So this is very, very tricky. So if the pupil comes down, you started your phacoid emulsification. The most important care you have to take is don't engage the CCC. And that's one thing that can happen. So it's very, very important that you put the viscoelastic below the iris lift the edge of the iris, and then go ahead and put the ring. So you can see that I had started phaco emulsification. I got stuck midway. And here, I released the two scrolls on the iris, OK? So only the inferior one, I could see the CCC margin well. And so I uh, took on to the iris. And the two nasal and the temporal, I then went on and engaged the iris. So this is one care you have to take. Otherwise, the CCC margin can come into the scroll, and you really not see it that well. So this is one most important care that you have to take if you have to put the ring midway uh, during phaco emulsification and the pupil comes down on you. So this is one important take home message. Now as you can see here, one ring has gone behind. Now this was a vitrectomized eye. Now in a vitrectomized eye, when you use a malugan ring, it behaves very, very differently. Okay, you'll see what happens because the chamber deepens and the iris tends to come out. So here again, I've engaged it quite well. This is the sub-incisional one. I'm going ahead and again engaging the iris. That was a little bit of cortex sitting there. I go ahead and just engage the sub-incisional one and everything is fine. Now just see what happens when I go in with FACO. When the chamber will deepen, okay, and see what happens to the scrolls. So they tend to come out the iris because the pupil actually dilates. Now you'll wonder why did I need to even have it because if the chamber is going to dilate so much anyway, you can go ahead and do your safe phaco emulsification. But when I started, it was not so large. And that was the thing that happened. So here you can see that the pupil really dilates well. And when it goes, when you come out, again the scrolls go into the, the scrolls take onto the iris. So this is quite uh, an issue that can happen in a vitrectomized eye. So you can see that here now I'm still holding on, going with IA, and you can see what happens. At this stage, of course, I could have removed the malugan ring and gone ahead and finished the IA and put the lens in the bag and everything would have been fine. So just an information that in a vitrectomized eye, if the pupil dilates well, sometimes the ring tends to come out of the scroll and this can happen. So just a take home message that be careful in a vitrectomized eye because the chamber really deepens as you can see here. I'm just going for the sub-incisional. This is a coaxial IA. You can use a bimanual, whatever you're used to. 
uh, just take care that that does not get engaged. Now, placing the IOL, okay, be careful at this stage. Now, if you're putting a three-piece IOL and you have the Melugan ring in place, be careful when you're dialing the haptic because this can actually try to remove or engage the edge of the ring. So you can see that the inferior haptic has gone into the bag and now I'm dialing the haptic. And at this stage, it can try to remove the scroll and you can see the edge and it's gone behind. But uh, nothing to worry again, same thing, use the T or a message Y and just disengage the iris from there and bring it up. So you can see that I've just brought it up and then just remove the Melugan ring. So this is one easy way of uh, doing it. And again, here I remove the nasal and the temporal, go beneath the scroll, make sure that the whole plate is seen. See here you can see that I'm above. So don't try to withdraw at this stage, it will break the ring in the eye. Again, go below, make sure that you're below the scroll completely. So at this stage, this, this step is very, very important to go below the scroll. Sometimes this will happen, not to worry, put some methyl cellulose or some viscoelastic below and just bring it, put the steel below and then just withdraw. So here I'm going ahead, making sure that it's in the, the steel plate is below the scroll and then just withdraw. And you have your second hand ready. This can also happen. The scroll can come above the plunger, but really not to worry. Just depress it a little bit and it comes out quite easily. So this is just to show you the removal. Here I did just disengage the sub-incisional, the nasal, the temporal, and the distant one are onto the iris. A little bit of desmond pull you can notice, but this can happen if you're superior. The whole plate is below. This is another, just to show you the last removal of the Melugan ring. It's very, very easy. Push the plunger ahead, engage the scroll, and retract the plunger and the whole ring will withdraw into the injector. It's as simple as that. So here, just make sure that that happens and the whole ring comes in one shot. So you can see that the whole ring comes out. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kumar, doctor. That was a very nice demonstration on uh, Maligan's ring. Now our chief instructor is back <laughs> on stage. So welcome, Suvan, back. You still take charge. <laughs> yeah. So he'll start his talk on his ring. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is IFIS and the BX. These are two topics. So uh, I have a financial disclosure to make in, my, by term, in terms of my uh, interest in the BX people expander and ownership in Medimed devices, private limited. So, uh, I'm thankful to the ophthalmic faculty for all the uh, honor bestowed upon me. Uh, so, now let's see this particular case. A standard cataract surgery was scheduled for toric IOL. Uh, yes, a little bit of short eye, 25 day with 4.5 D cylinder. Uh, I guess not many of you would choose to do a iris hooks or a pupil expander over here. So, same with me, but as I was injecting viscoelastic and coming out, I noticed that uh, that iris, there was a little light, but slight bit of tinge, uh, hint of iris prolapse over there. So I thought I'd rather be safe than sorry. So went ahead and used the BHEX pupil expander. But then, and I thought things would be fine because now I had the pupil under my control. Uh, but then to my surprise, I see the iris prolapsing through the side port. And well, as we progressed a little bit more, we had the iris prolapsing through the main incision. Uh, but the good news was my pupil was constant size and I could get about, go about doing my phaco surgery peacefully. We did manage to tame that iris prolapse and bring it back and do that surgery, put in that IOL, and we got that fine. We did that all well. But yes, had I not used the pupil expander that day, I would have been in big trouble. So, ex post facto, how many of you would have used iris hooks and pupil expanders is a question, which maybe you would now have second thoughts. And what we need to remember is iris hooks and pupil expanders have a definite role in IFIS. They do not prevent iris prolapse. What they do is give you a constant pupil size, which provides adds to the safety and for visibility. 
If you thought that Indian eyes are kind of immune to IFS, well, we are wrong. This is a wonderful paper. And this suggested that the eye incidence of IFS was much higher in India compared to the other literature available. And current time solution alpha in use and hypertension are important risk factors. This has been, again, uh, further stated in other publications. So that is the list of causative factors for IFS. And if you can see, no amount of history taking is going to be foolproof. So the given that list, every alternate patient is a potential candidate for IFS. So we need to brace ourselves in the theater for surprises. Safe pre-op pupil size is something which we talk about often and uh, we make a note in our uh, pre-op examination as, okay, five millimeters people or four millimeters, six millimeters, eight millimeters. And we would think, okay, this is not a potential candidate for IFS. Well, that also has been kind of proven a little wrong by this paper by Alessandro Casiccio and co-workers in 2011. For a people seven millimeter or smaller, the risk of IFS existed regardless of alpha one blocker intake. So that is huge. So the lessons that we learned that IFS can occur in pretty good seven millimeters pupils also. And we need to remember that women are often on tamsulosin for UTI and various other reasons. And like I said, iris hooks do not eliminate iris prolapse. What they do is give you a constant pupil size for good visualization and adds to your safety. So this is what we need to understand is that there are basically two subsets. One is the rigid pupil, which is basically a fibrous band or a non-elastic pupil, and the elastic pupil, which is going to stretch and come back. So if we look, uh, these are a few videos, very old videos, even before IFS was recognized. I just pulled, out, pulled them out from my uh, archives. And if you see that, that is the fluttering of the iris. That's just grade one IFS, which is rather the benign types. And this is a myopic eye where we are dealing with IFS and look at what is happening. The pupil is large to start with, comes down on me, iris starts prolapsing, I re-inject viscoelastic and inflate the antechamber and the pupil goes back to its big size and yet again it can come back on me and it, it just is a cat and mouse game which goes on one after, one after the other. So try as much as I may this is going to keep happening because that's the nature of that iris. So now, if you thought that iris hooks are going to add safety and not going to cause iris plus, again, we are wrong. So this is a case where I used iris hooks. And even before I had finished my capsular excess, my iris was frayed and looked like a fishing net. And I had difficulty putting my phaco probe in. So that is how iris can behave. It's a huge spectrum. So what? And then, uh, of course, you will have that uh, patulous iris over there. Uh, you can see that, that the patulous iris is like a sail over there. And you need to be careful about putting your, and that's that knuckle of iris which is there. We don't need to deal with it. And every time you go into the antechamber, whether it's a FACO probe or your uh, uh, IL cartridge, you need to be careful that we don't engage that prolapsing iris and cause the iridialysis. So uh, this is, in summary, the take home messages for IFS. Uh, these are, we have already dealt with all of these. The, important thing is that stopping tamsulosin is of no value whatsoever, and you may actually land up with urinary retention, and it's not going to serve any useful purpose for us. And tamsulosin intake, even three to seven days prior to your surgery, can really cause IFS. So these are the, these are the complications, and is that my time, or? Okay. So mechanical dilatation is, you can use pupil stretching, but you need to be very careful where you use it. An IFS is going to be useless, so we have the iris hooks and the pupil expanders, the malignant ring, the BHEX pupil expander, and a whole lot of them. So that's the BHEX pupil expander. We have a hexagon with notches and flanges. The alternate flanges are tucked under the pupil margin, so the notches engage the pupil margin and cause pupil expansion. The malignant ring is brilliant, no doubt about that, and Boris deserves all the credit for bringing a wonderful tool to us. But then the, my problem was it's a biplanar device and it snags the incision on the way in and way out. And that's exactly why they need an injector. All devices are biplanar devices and that's why they require an injector. So I had to think some, about something around this problem. So I had an inventive concept, which is, and that's a patented device now. So uh, we thought that the iris could be bent harmlessly and reversibly. So we brought the device to a single plane and the iris was now being bent at the notches and the device remained in a single plane. That way it won't snag the incision on the way in and or way out. And we did not require, require an injector. We could use a 23 gauge forceps to take it in and bring it out and it just glides through the incision. 
My suggestion would be that you should watch a few videos because the design looks very simple, simple and it could be actually deceptive. Uh, the small tips, uh, you need to keep the antechamber underfilled. Overfilling pushes the iris against the lens capsule and uh, would make it difficult for any device to be used. So when you inject viscoelastic, the iris get plastered onto the eye uh, uh, lens capsule, so you need to inject viscoelastic under the pupil margin to lift off the iris, uh, iris a little bit, and that's how you get make space. So that's the, the uh, injection of viscoelastic. Very little inject viscoelastic in front of the pupil. What you need to do is a little bit of inject viscoelastic under the pupil margin so that you have a space for the device. So, but if your uh, pupil is less than four millimeters, and especially if it's a rigid pupil, you need to stretch it a little bit by manually to use a device because that way you get a cosmetically good pupil and you have a controlled sphincter tear, which you'll have to do anyway in a rigid pupil. So how do you differentiate a rigid pupil from... Uh, so inject BSS from the side port, and if that pupil expands slightly momentarily, you know that it's an, it's an elastic pupil. You see what's happening over here. Inject and it expands. This is going to be good, but look at this. This is pseudo exfoliation pupil, and you're going to inject viscoelastic and it's not going to budge. So that tells you that it's a rigid pupil and you will need to, and this of course is a absolutely rigid pupil, it's a little bit of extropion UV over there. So you will need to call, do a bimanual stretch and then inject a viscoelastic and get that pupil to a larger size. So that's uh, something we've talked about. So it's rigid pupils, four to five millimeters, controlled sphincter tear. A bulky pupil expander may stretch the pupil but would produce uncontrolled tears and would be unwieldy. And a, a delicate device like the BHEX would, would not do that, but you need to stretch the pupil in advance to get a cosmetically good pupil. Let's see what we did over here. This is a uveitic pupil, and I tried uh, doing a sinuculysis and release that thing, and then I did a uh, membrane. I tried to remove that, sorry, yes. I tried to remove the membranes with the forceps, but it really didn't help. And so we went ahead and did a stretch. And if you see, I'm not doing a limbus to limbus stretch. I'm not doing it angle to angle stretch. It's just a limited stretch so that I get a 4.5 to 5 pupil, which allows me to put the BHEX in. And then we went ahead and we put the BHEX pupil expander in, and we had a nice round uh, hexagonal pupil, which allowed us surgery and good visualization. We now recommend only the 23 gauge BHEX forceps because it gives us the most controlled, sorry. So. So that's how we take the BHEX inside and tuck it under the, the, we need to place the device onto the iris first. We do not want to tuck the first flange in the first pass. We need to place the device onto the iris and then we go ahead and tuck those flanges because then we get the entire device in one plane and onto iris. Fixation of the globe helps as you're manipulating with the 23 gauge forceps. What's important is uh, Kumar showed you a lot of uh, videos on with the malignant ring uh, after a capsular excess has been done. Uh, well, it's a little difficult with the malignant ring because your gap with the malignant ring is something which you can't see. It's away from it and you really ca can engage the capsular excess margin and it's potentially dangerous over there. So here with the B-hex, you can just inject a little bit of viscoelastic under th on the anterior capsular rim and just lift off the iris. And since you can see the notches, they're staring at you, you practically have no chance of engaging the capsular excess margin. And as you advance that flange, you have instant confirmation that you have not engaged the capsular excess margin. And under direct visibility, you're tucking those flanges. So it's a very safe device. And you really don't, don't need so many manipulations. So once you have done that, you have a nice size and a pupil and you're back to your comfort zone. So one more small tip is that the trailing haptic, since the uh, BX expanded pupil is 5.5 millimeters, uh, it is desirable that you tuck the, put the trailing haptic in one single motion into the bag. If you fail to do that, well, there is a remedy for that. I'll just show you. Now, this is how we put the trailing haptic in one single motion into the bag. That way, you do not have to push the ring and the pupil margin. Otherwise, you end up dislodging the pupil margin, the ring from the pupil margin. If you cannot do that, what you need to do is push the haptic tra leading, uh, trailing haptic optic junction in a way that the leading haptic optic junction kind of flexes and the push is over there. You do not push the ring or the pupil margin. And then you tuck that trailing haptic into the bag. Oh, removal, sorry. So, and the BHEX removal is very simple. You can just hold a flange, disengage two notches on either side, no heroics, no rocket signs, and just draw it out of the incision and the trailing notches just disengage spontaneously. You could even remove it through a one millimeter side port 
and you just inject viscoelastic under the flange, hold that with the forceps, and let me just advance this a little bit. And you disengage that notch over there, the two notches on either side, and you just draw the device. Don't bother with the trailing notches because they're going to disengage spontaneously. That's how the, the mechanics of the de device works. And you have a wonderful, nice pupil. These are a couple of publications in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and the JCRS. Uh, you could read them. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry I overdid my time. Uh, Nino, can you call next? You, you're coming next or Deepak? Dr. Deepak will now talk on uh, uh, pseudo exfoliation of small pupils. Thank you. Uh, morning, friends. So I'll be talking about a scenario which we see day in and day out of in our practice. I think uh, uh, in the at least in our country, I think, you know, majority of the people for cataract have some form of pseudo exfoliant hazard. This fibrillar material deposits on the pupil and the zonules, and these are the two structures which predominantly affect our uh, intraoperative uh, surgery. The pupil doesn't dilate, and zonules are extremely weak. So we need to take care and address both these issues. So some of the strategies to deal with poor midriasis, which I have been using over the past many years, is one just simple stretching. So I use a Kuglan hook, just to stretch them. And a combination of this stretching and viscomidriasis is good enough in quite a few number of cases itself. So you don't have to do anything more than this. So you can just inject the viscoelastic uh, over the pupillary margin and you can see it widens. And micro spintrotomies, which uh, I was doing quite a few of them a couple of years back, few years back maybe. The trick here is to, you know, you not uh, do a very big sphincterotomy, about, say, less than 0.5 millimeter uh, of the incision you can do. The only disadvantage is, apart from the appearance of the pupil, is that it won't dilate very much as it is not under your, it has got a limitation to which, but uh, it, it doesn't at least come down. So at least in that aspect, you're okay, but it can be counterproductive if you're dealing with a case of IFIS. And this is a post-operative appearance of the micro sphincterotomy if you're done very carefully. It is functional also and cosmetically doesn't look uh, bad itself. Now moving on to the iris hooks, we were, I, was, I still do use iris hooks in uh, situations. These are the few uh, tips which I'd like to share here is that the, my two hooks which are near uh, the incision has to be quite near to the um, main incision. It helps the you know, uh, tenting up of the iris and also as it has to be more scleral incision uh, as Dr. Arup was mentioning uh, before. And moving on to my latest uh, device, uh, thank you, Suvain, for giving us this device. And this is, has been my practice in majority of the situations. Again, we need to remember the point that all these eyes with rigid pupils, whenever we are using a device uh, like the behexing or most mechanical pupil devices, we need to stretch the pupil before imparting this thing. After injecting viscoelastic under the iris, this is my standard protocol. I always use my side port first and place the ring identically in this situation so that, you know, at one shot I can place two, uh, the four notches. I can engage four notches of the ring at, uh, during one maneuver only. I don't have to change at all. And the second trick would be stabilize the globe with your uh, left hand. I just switch one more time, but two passes, I think I'm able to engage all the notches of the BHEX ring here, and uh, we have a very nicely dilated pupil, and it serves me well for the rest, uh, rest of the procedure. And as we can see, you know, in most of these exfoliation cases, we have to expect to lose zonules, as is evident in this case here. Uh, in this case, I decide to inject my CTR before and itself. Again, the pearl here would be to create a little bit of space under the capsule by injecting OVD so that uh, you have enough space uh, between the lens capsule and the cortex for the ring to go in. And use my second instrument just to uh, ensure that I don't uh, put enough stress on the zonules. And it also helps me to guide the ring nicely under the bag. So once the uh, bag, looseness of the bag is taken care of and the pupil is also taken care of, it really becomes much more simpler and safer to manage uh, all these uh, cases. And this is a, a dense cataract here. And once it is done, 
we are going to implant the lens here, and then before removing the OVD, I am going to uh, uh, ring, bring out the BHEX ring. And its removing is extremely simple. I again prefer to use the side port. At one shot, I disengage all of them, and then remove it through the main wound. And we can see the pupillary margin. It is very minimally distorted and uh, appears quite good. Another case of a pseudo exfoliation and a hypermature dense cataract here. Again, important thing is you want to uh, inject a little bit of OVD under the iris because because you, it's an intumescent lens. You don't want to you know uh, damage the capsule during your stretching maneuver. I'm not stretching here very much here because to consciously not to you know you don't want a very extremely large pupil. So if you're a little bit uh, stretching is controlled, then you can minimize the amount of distortion you're going to get uh, at the end of the surgery. Again, first introduce the BHEX ring. Again, I'm going through my side port and stabilizing the globe with the second instrument here. So introduce the uh, uh, for two notches, engage the uh, pupillary margin, and next, the second, again, flange. Hold the second flange and engage the remaining two notches, and then switch hands and using the other side port and stabilize the globe and uh, just engage the other notches. It's so easily it can be done. I prefer to follow this standardized regimen so it becomes much more predictable. Again, you have a nice, uh, the surgery becomes extremely well controlled. Since the visibility is increased, the safety margin definitely improves. See, basically the fundamental principle of any surgery is we need to see well, okay? So these pupillary expansion devices ensure that we see well and the surgery is uh, under control. So I don't find any problem with the IOL insertion as we are telling, but uh, you can, uh, it, it really is not an issue at all. So before removing the uh, OVD, just remove the thing and then uh, thing. So my current practice in small people management is uh, BHEX ring, but uh, few situations I would prefer an iris hook, definitely. There is a definite indication Whenever things just go it, and as planned, uh, whatever way you are going, you know, the advantage iris hooks provide is, you know, you can control the amount of uh, pupillary dilatation you want. So you really can, because it is fixed at the limbus, you can stretch it. This is a situation where I was converting from uh, FACO to SISS because the rexis has gone bad and it's out. I was not able to see the equator of the rexis margin. So I had to revert back to my iris hooks so that I could really stretch the pupil well. And now I could see all the detail of the rexis, where it is and everything, so that my intraocular lens goes into a place where it really has to. So this is one advantage with the, ring, uh, with the hooks. This is another case where I've had a peripheral PC rent and the pupil is coming down on me now. So this is a situation where, in this situation, I don't think there is any other device for me to help me to see where my rexis edge is and where the PC tear is. So really I can stretch the pupil, pupil up to the limbus there and ensure my I drop my haptic of the multi-piece lens over the rexis margin and it doesn't go into the rent rather. And this is one way of ensuring that you are placing the, uh, the, your uh, haptics in the sulcus and then you can achieve an optic capture. So definitely in certain situations iris hooks are invaluable, especially you want to see the peripheral part of uh, your capsular bag or the capsular uh, capsulotomy margins. That's all. Uh, that's all it would be. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Deepak, for comprehensively covering the entire topic, iris hooks, BX, everything, and pseudo exploration, of course, and for your wonderful videos. For those who have not seen Deepak's videos on YouTube, he's got a huge following, and he makes some wonderful videos. Thank you, Deepak, once again. Now I'll invite Dr. Minu Mathan. Minu is a very accomplished surgeon at Chaitanya Hospital in uh, Trivandrum. He has seen it all from ECC, SICS, FACO and Femto FACO, but I insist that he speaks on MSCICS because he's got a huge amount of experience and we'd like to hear from Minu Mathan, MSCICS in small people eyes. Thank you, Minu. Thank you, Dr. Suvan. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, session. Uh, um, we all do SICS, is it not? We all do SICS. Okay, and last he told us that he'll use iris hooks when he converts to SICS. So there are, I've heard many talks that in small pupils, there's no need for uh, uh, iris hooks. Well, whatever people you can do, I say, that's fine. That's fine. With the people who are good at that, with uh, good hands, that's fine. But then I would like to, I have no financial interest in this talk. So the problem is that we need a larger rexis. I'm talking about bad cataracts, where I do phacos also. So very hard cataracts, very bad corneas, 
I tend to do SICA. So I will be focusing on that kind of mature hard cataracts and all. So here you need to do a large dexis to bring out the nucleus. The FACO, you don't need a large dexis to uh, chop out the nucleus. And the whole nucleus has to be prolapsed into the anterior chamber in toto. So that is the major two differences in this one. So here it is a mid-dilated pupil. This is a 5 millimeter pupil, okay? But it's a very hard nucleus, but it is a hypermature cataract. So if you do not want to, this is a bare-handed technique. In FACO, it's easy. You can just do it this size and continue. But then here, if you, if you touch at the bottom part of this rexus, you can extend it and then bring it inwards. And then again, hold on to the undersurface and then pull it back. You will extend it beyond the iris. So you'll have two strokes forwards, two strokes backwards. So you will make it around six millimeter under the iris. But this is not at all a standardized technique. You will never know how big you have made it. You will be sometimes lucky, sometimes unlucky. So you will deliver the whole bag if the pupil is, the rex is not big enough. So here I may be lucky because the periphery of these kind of cataracts, you will have a lot of uh, cortex which is uh, supporting the nucleus and it's hypermature. So the nucleus size may not be that very huge. So you might be able to bring it out. But then again, you have to prolapse it. So the pupil, get, the lens gets stuck within the pupil. So if it is a rigid pupil with pseudo exfoliation, it's very, very difficult. But if it is a lax pupil like this, atonic pupil, you can fix it with visco underneath it and on, on the sides and tighten it and then catch it very well with the Sinsky. Engage the Sinsky at the equator and rotate. But then here again, a smaller pupil and definitely you would have done a smaller rexus and here you need a forceful hydrodissection. Suddenly see the pupil snapping. This is a pupil snap sign. So if you do a high forceful hydrodissection without decompressing and the fluid collects behind the lens and the lens uh, comes up and blocks your rexus and the fluid collects behind and blows, uh, blows out your posterior capsule. Again here, so it may not suddenly drop. In SICS, you can always prolapse this out and get away with the nucleus, but you would have ended up with a uh, posterior capsule rupture. Here, uh, Dr. Deepak has shown very clearly, it's a very old video, sorry for, sorry for the quality. It's after seeing Dr. Deepak's video quality, I'm very ashamed to look at my video like this, but it's a very old one. Only point in SICS is if you are extending it through a large incision, the, your visco will escape. So go through paracentesis if possible, or put sodium hyaluronate before doing this and use Kuglen hooks and then also do not touch the edge of the anterior capsule and also beware of DM detachments at the con at the at the at the uh, angles when you're closing in at the angles when you're stretching very drastically. So uh, I would show you three cases of SICS with hard cataract small view. So again my f my hook goes under underneath the upper lip. So here is the upper lip and you make a small incision underneath that. And then after engaging, here again, the idea should be to stretch it as, as big as you want. For a FACO, you need only a 5.5. But then here you need at least 6 millimeters, 6.5 millimeters. So you should have, will have to stretch the pupil further. Here, you can use whichever way you're comfortable doing your rexus. And then, see, identify the rexus margin, go to the equator, hook the equator, no scratching through the surface on the, or the uh, cortex. You have to uh, hook the equator and then bring it out. See, again, if you go through the cornea, as Dr. Arup has said, you will crowd the uh, anterior segment, anterior chamber. The point is that you have to go very close to the limbus and parallel to the, limb, parallel to the iris plane. So it should be just pulled back. So with the, all the hooks retained, I can prolapse the whole nucleus into the anterior chamber. And then this hooks gives way. Get, not gives way means it gives a side. It just gets pu pushed towards the side. You can easily deliver such a huge nucleus also through this incision without creating damage and you can place any IOL into the capsule bag. See, just wanted to show you. See, this is the type of incision, size of incision. See, you identify the size of your hook. So this is a 27 gauge needle. 27 net gauge, net gauge, uh, gauge needle, I'm making a incision there and see the needle going in through this, it doesn't go. So that much of size is only what is required for your uh, hook to go inside if you're using a Grishaber hook. So do, you're, in SICS, you have two paracentesis, one or two large ones, you have a large incision. Again, multiple incisions makes the smallest possible for your hook to go inside. So this is again a very hard cataract. So here again, as I told you, my incision will be just on the undersurface of the inner lip, inner lip of the uh, one, so that you, because if you have it on either sides, every time you pass instruments through that, you might be tending to hook your iris also along. So have your eyes back at your under your incision and staining it, you can always stain it uh, uh, 
um, see, when you are putting the hooks, you need visco. So if you put HPMC, and then you will have to wash all the HPMC out and then uh, uh, put uh, stain, because otherwise it will get mixed with the HPMC. So in see, thus these cases, I will, I usually put um, sodium hyaluronate, and then put the iris hook, and then if you put a little two, three drops of saline on the surface of the anterior capsule, then you can create a plane of fluid between the sodium hyaluronate and the anterior capsule, and then you can stain. And here I have removed one of this. Just before prolapsing the nucleus, I have removed one hook, so that your, you have, this doesn't come in your way. You can do like this also. I'm giving you three options. One is retaining all the hooks, and here again, going to the periphery and rotating. Here, I know that it's fully rotating and fully mobile. This part of the nucleus is not out of the, ba out of into the anterior cha chamber, but it is free inside the bag, I'm sure, and this is out. So you need not actually prolapse that. You can go underneath it very easily, look at the edge of your vectors always, it should not engage your iris also, and then such a huge lens also comes out cleanly through your incision. And after this, I, you, to, if the pupil has become much smaller, if you want to see this area, put your hook back in, and then retract and identify your excess margin. This is a very big excess which we have made, and then you will have some uh, cortex, because in these kind of cases, cortex is not very easily, they cannot aspirate. You will have some chunks of uh, calcified cortex here and there sticking at the equator. You will have to identify every, and you can put in a foldable lens also. The advantage of using an injector is that you, the lens will not touch on any of the surface of the surface of the eye. You can deliver it directly, the implant can go into the capsular bag directly, and this is the last case. This is a, again a hypermature cataract. Here again, it's going to be iris hooks. So I am putting all four hooks and retracting it well so that I get a six millimeter uh, uh, pupillary area. And then a rexus which is very wide to let this uh, lens out. This lens is not as big as the previous lens, but then this is a very hard lens. Hypermature ones, they are very uh, rock hard and they don't, they don't budge. So you have to have enough space and these kind of capsules are not elastic enough and so you have to create a larger rexus. Here, I am disengaging and not taking them out. So I disengage one, two, and take this out, and then rotate it. Again, the pupil might become like slightly smaller, so use viscoelastic to push the iris back, and then engage this and take it out. Here it looks messy because there is a lot of cortex, which is uh, um, uh, white cortex, which is sticking onto the nucleus, and here both of these are disengaged and just retained there. And then you deliver this nucleus out to the technique which you always follow, any technique, and then put the iris hooks back again to engage the uh, iris, and then look at the rexus margin and finish your cortex aspiration. Because after that, you will have to look at the rexus margin and finish your cortex aspiration. And then an IOL, any of your choice, can go into the capsular bag. And then removal of hooks was shown by Dr. Arup. And in this way, I would say, if it is small pupil and the nucleus is hard, I would use iris retractor hooks in SICS also to have a better outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minu. Uh, thank you, all co-instructors, for finishing on time. We still have 10 minutes, and we'll be happy to take any questions. Dr. Yastad is still with us, and uh, anybody in the audience would like to ask a question to the panelists, to co-instructors? Co we have Dr. Arun Bhomik, Dr. Minu, Deepak, myself, and Dr. Yastad. Any questions? Yes, sir. One, one thing I've noticed in using the rings and the, and the uh, hooks is that um, if you do have floppy iris and it's coming out, of the incision, um, I often put a ring in just for that reason alone, and that seems to hold the the uh, iris. I, I, I didn't get you. You put in what? Uh, Malugan ring or yeah, ring. yeah. So it it can uh, it can eliminate the uh, iris prolapse, just that that ring. Yeah, it does because it dampens the billowing of the iris to some extent. But uh, since the iris iris itself can be a little pathological and uh, thin. So it would prolapse anyway sometimes. Depends upon the which end of the spectrum that, that particular eye falls. <coughs> Any other comments or uh, questions? Yeah, can you please uh, speak into the mic? There's a floor mic over here for the benefit of all. I have a question. Uh, when we put the Vatajorji ring or Malijun ring, there is a lot of instability in the entry chamber. So what, uh, what are your preferred settings of FECO? In that cataract? No, there is, uh, if you have the ring engaged to the pupil margin, there won't be any instability unless you're using a very high But there is a lot of movement of the ring inside while doing FECO. Not really that I have noticed, but well, if you have working on a very high flow rate, yes, it may. Or when you choose to remove the ring with under uh, 
BSS. That these are two situations because some of the surgeons are using hydro injection of lens. That is one situation where you will have because when you have BSS only in the anterior chamber, then you and a lot of flow rate we could. But really, we don't see so much of uh, movement of the. So reduction of flow rate will. Uh, of course, a reduction of flow rate will reduce all movement in the anterior chamber. That's the bottom line. Okay, thank you. Hello. Actually, yes. th there is a lot of uh, anterior chamber fluctuation after uh, putting a pupillary device. It's only uh, occurred during the lens iris diaphragm retor palsen syndrome. The yes. pupil can suddenly stretch out. That yes. uh, Kumar, uh, Dr. Kumar shows his video. But that is the time that your pup uh, that uh, ring can dislodge. The only this a, in that case is better to keep your irrigation and aspiration in the lower size. It will help it. Uh, that's so a, that's a good point, Arup. And another point, if you're uh, ch uh, during the uh, removal of the nuclear fragment, if it is large. quite a large, then it 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 hits the uh, pupillary margin, it can dislodge. In that case, it is better to uh, make a smaller pieces or during removal, it is very, at least first to uh, removal, it should be very, very small. Fragments. I agree. The later you can remove the larger one, but uh, the first uh, two, you make a small, remove the smaller one for the back. Uh, good thing you brought up the uh, LIDRS uh, 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 question because actually if you have a ring in place, you will not have the retropulsion syndrome because the pupil margin does not get plastered on the iris because the ring, either the malugan ring or the BX or anything, some part of it is sticking under the pupil margin. So it does not allow a wat two watertight compartments to happen. So to some extent, yes, but still you can have in myopic eyes, you can have it. So that's a very good point and that's when you will have huge uh, fluctuations in the anterior chamber. Yeah, any other comments, questions? Yeah. Sir, so uh, Dr. Suvin, we have been, I have been using this uh, device of yours for a while and it works wonderfully well. Thank you. Would you pinpoint some conditions where it is truly contraindicated and you will use iris hooks, uh, you know? I think Deepak brought it out very well. Yeah. Any place where you feel that you need a very large rexus, one, you got a r r run a running out rexus, two, subluxation. Subluxation, you could move it like a picture frame, but nothing will give you the kind of visibility like an iris hook will give you a focal, you can retract it focally in one place and int uh, view the entire uh, zonal, the area of zonal deficit. Deepak, would you like to make a comment on that? Uh, apart from all this, a peripheral PC rent, you're suspecting a peripheral PC rent, and uh, because they're visible, you can't see. You have to really, you know, you have to stretch the pupil at that quadrant and then see. Because further steps of where you want to push, pu put the lens in everything, that is very critical. And the second, you, if you want to have a, you are landed up in a situation where you would want to convert to SICS. Yes. yes. Many times you are, you are expecting a PC rent and the pupil has come down, you want to convert to an SICS. And visibility is compromised. That is a situation where you have to remove the BX ring and uh, go in and do a, uh, uh, use the iris hooks. Yeah, in most other situations where if you already have a ring in place, and you still need, actually what happens is the ring is going to center anyway. Okay, even if you move it like a picture frame to the side, it's going to eventually come back. So if you really wanted to, to see some, a particular quadrant, you could take an iris hook over the ring and kind of draw it out, that's it, if it serves your purpose. But if you feel that it's going to be uh, more of a hindrance, you could take out the ring and then put iris hooks yeah, like that. Yeah, that. that serves a purpose if you are maneuvering, further maneuvering, maneuvering are very limited. Yes, yes. Uh, like if you want to bring the entire bulky nucleus out oh of yeah, the that's thing. No, no, in uh, SIC, if you're converting to SICs, there's yes, no question. question. Because this is going to offer you only a 5.5. Yeah, and you're going true. to take out a bi bulky nucleus, you're going to dislodge the ring anyway. No, your idea is very good, actually. Your idea of just putting one ring, over, one hook over like an existing Like you had a PC ring. rent. Yeah. You had a PC rent. You could have just drawn it on. Yeah, side. that was a situation where the PC rent has occurred during cortex extraction and you've got a small peripheral yes, rent yes. and you don't have to do much maneuvering and that is a situation where putting an uh, extra hook would serve the purpose. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So when? Yeah. The, I have faced a situation a uh, few days back, the iris is so much atonic and so much floppy that each time I make an effort to go through the sideboard to the chopper, I'm engaging the iris and yeah. there is a distinct apprehension of disinserting, I mean, uh, creating an iris paralysis. Yeah. So how do I overcome this situation? Yeah, there are sorry. two ways you need to do that. Actually, I, I, in the interest of time, I can show it in my videos, it was there. Two things. One is if you're going to what reposit that iris through the same side port, 
it's like saying the proof of insanity is trying to do the same thing repeatedly and expecting a different result. It's going to keep coming back. Okay. So the trick is you change your angle of attack. You go in through the other side port or through the main incision and then draw it in okay, with a with second instrument. And then you inject a bit of high molecular viscoelastic right over there. So when you're inserting your next instrument, whether it's the FACO probe or the uh, cartridge nozzle, it, it doesn't, the uh, iris doesn't have an opportunity to come out before you are inside. And actually, if you are going in with your FACO probe, you could even use your side uh, second instrument and hold on to that iris and not allow it to prolapse while you're FACO probe. No, FACO probe, probe I could manage. FACO probe I could manage, but was I was facing the difficulty by, by going through the chopper, the side port. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's chopper. It's you'll have to deposit it, uh, deposit it, so and put a bit of viscoelastic over there, and then go in with the chopper. That's, that's, sir, that's uh, it. Sir, uh, yeah. In in cases of uh, severe IFIS, there is a, even after putting pupillary device like Maligwin ring or BX ring, there is a chance of mid peripheral iris prolapse. Yes. And the base of iris prolapse, and that is uh, in your case, that is uh, happening during the chopper. Uh, you every time iris is coming. In in that situation. You leave uh, uh, after reposition of uh, iris from the other port. You just this leave that port. Go more corneal, make a s uh, make a fresh wound for the side port. Go more corneal, and it will solve the problem. Right. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, we'll we're just in time. We still have one minute, but we'll call the session to close. Uh, thank you, all my co-instructors uh, and wonderful audience. Look forward to seeing you next year. Uh, can we?